My name is Saima Akhtar. I'm the Associate Director of the Vagilos Computational Science Center at Barnard College. And we really work on making computation and learning computation ex skills accessible to Barnard students and beyond and really lowering the barrier of entry into computation. And so this is part of that effort. And I'm going to hand it over to our post back fellow, Zoe Webb-Mack, and she and two Barnard students who are also competing fellows will be leading this workshop. So take it away, Zoe. Thank you so much, Saima. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So today we're going to be doing a short introduction to data visualization. We're going to be using Python and we're going to be using two libraries within Python for data visualization and data manipulation called Altair and Pandas. Before we get started with the coding portion, we're going to go over some quick basics of data visualization. So I'm going to hand it over to one of our computing fellows, Pranathi, who's going to walk you through some of this. Pranathi, as well as yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Pranathi. Thank you for the introduction, Zoe. So this workshop is, as Zoe said, an introduction to data visualization using Python. And we thought it would be important before we jump into the actual coding to talk a little bit about data visualization. But in general, for our agenda for the, the day, we're going to start off with the general principles about data visualization, a few words on how to interpret and structure visualizations, and then we're going to be using a platform called Google Colab to learn the basics of Python and to eventually visualize an NYC open data set about eviction using, as we said, the Altair and Pandas libraries. Something that's really important for when we create data visualizations is to think about what they can do. And so data visualizations are very powerful, right? Because you have a entire data set, which is hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of numbers, and they all describe something that you've measured, but it doesn't come together until you're able to draw a plot or like a graph. And what's really helpful is that data visualizations can both be used to uncover relationships when you're doing that initial parts of your data, and it can be used to explore and analyze your data, as well as then when you present those data visualizations to other people, they can communicate trends and find truths about that data set. And then it can also be used to present an argument about the data, about the variables that you're comparing. In this way, data science and data visualizations and the production of them can be used to be both a tool of exploration and also a tool of communication. And I think all of us know, especially after seeing so many graphs and statistics about the pandemic and COVID-19, that data is pretty important. And across all spheres and sectors, it's important to be able to understand how to best make our visualizations helpful to other people. So it, on that vein, some general guidelines that are very important is that when you are making your initial data data visualization, it's good to match visualization types as well as your data types. So it can be if you're not really sure what your graph is telling you or what your data needs to needs to be the most clear, it can be helpful to start off with a bar chart, which is what we're going to do, and then try out other chart styles, line plots, histograms, etc. So something else that's helpful in terms of design is to think about color schemes and how it's very helpful to use high contrast color schemes whenever possible. And that's because when there are when there are very high cost contrast color schemes for different variables, it makes it pretty easy to see that there are two different trends being found. Whereas for people who happen to have visual vision difficulties, it can be hard if it can be hard to see what your data is saying if the colors are too similar. And so on that vein, it's helpful to use sequential, diverging, or categorical color schemes if appropriate. And lastly, the words around our data charts or our data visualizations are very important. So it's good to keep our type simple, but descriptive. So that's thinking axes, labels, captions, stuff like that. So something that takes us, that takes data visualizations a step further is to think about the context within which our data visualizations are placed in. This book by Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren F. Klein is called Data Feminism. It's a very valuable book that talks about a lot of the different things that we will also be talking about, but it definitely goes into further depth. So if this next part of the slideshow is something you find interesting, then definitely look back at this resource. And specifically out of these different principles of feminist data visualization, the one that we will be thinking about is considering context, specifically the social historical context, which we'll actually see an application of as we go through our data set. The guiding principle about this part of the workshop is that 
data doesn't exist in a vacuum. Every visualization presents an argument by and by comparing two parameters, you are implicitly creating a connection between two variables. And so it's our obligation as people who, as a data scientist or data, just anyone who uses data to think about how we got here, why we got here and what it is, what, and what has impacted what we're seeing. So for example, here's a example graphic about mental health disparities in jail, in jails. And so we have this, we have this little visualization. We can see that there are on one side, there's a mix of race and ethnicity groups. And on the left side, there actually isn't an access label, but there is a title and the title tells us that it's talking about mental health diagnoses depending on by different races of people who are in the jail. So there are a few things that could be better about this visualization. I'm sure you guys are seeing that. Some things that are good to notice are that in general, this data set doesn't really mention the years, the specific jails or the population that's being talked about in this data set in the title. And that's something that we should be including because not everyone is going to go read the caption. And so it's important to have the most important information easily accessible. And so another thing is this title is vague and unclear. We don't really know what diagnosis specifically refer refers to. Is it referrals or literal diagnoses, symptomology? We're not entirely sure. And then also this left axis is just completely unlabeled. And so this percentage, it could be of all white people in the in this jail. Are they a bit over 20 percent of that population or is it 20 percent of all inmates who are diagnosed are white? And I think that's pretty important to think about because those two interpretations can either depend on the racial breakdown of who is in that jail versus it's just fairly unclear. And I think everyone understands that. On top of that, there's no mention about any race that's other than white or black. There's also, of course, some intersection between white and black Hispanic people, and there's no mention of what Hispanic means there. And also for people who are multiracial, we also have no indication about those groups of people. So there's a lot of things to keep on thinking about. Something that's helpful in this situation is to think about some of the problems that we found were things that were a problem with the methodology of, of whoever was collecting the data. But then there's also a side of it where literally just changing the words around your graph can have a pretty big impact. And so in this case, here are two or three attempts. There's a second or third attempt. And there's something to be said about how these are maybe an improvement or not so much an improvement of or not a strong enough improvement of what we saw in the first in the first graph. And the last one was that a force of control racism is included in the analysis. It's not just left up to the interpretation of the reader to figure out why it might be that people are receiving mental health diagnoses, but sorry, the types of people who are receiving mental health diagnoses and why some people are receiving them and some people aren't. How is it being measured? When is it being measured? And all of those are again, very important to add. But on the left side, at least there's some acknowledgement that there is something structurally, historically, and socially going on to create this outcome. And then for the one on the right, at least there are access labels and there are, and even if we can't get more specificity in that side, at least there is a better description of what is happening in on both the x and y axis and then there's also a description of the population and the years which is very important as well i think someone in the chat above said that even the subtitle of white populations receive more care isn't necessarily specific enough and i agree and that's why it's important when you are coming up with the things that frame your graphics to come up with something that is both word efficient, but also takes into account all of these things. So the purpose of this part was to really get us to think about what the implications of our words are when the data stays the same, but what we put around it changes. In general, something that's also important to think about is that we must recognize, name, and incorporate knowledge of structural inequities into our data analysis. On a data collection level, this can really look including demographic information about your different participants as you are gaining your information about them, but as we, but it's still important or possible to incorporate those analyses, even if we can't control the data ourselves, because 
obviously, we're obviously not going to be able to impact that now as we're analyzing the data. And someone asked what structural inequities means. Structural inequities speak to broader causes of health, not just health disparities, but disparities in different sectors that affect certain people more than others. So if we want to think historically, something people may know about is redlining and how banks and different government institutions were, were involved in this too. Different institutions would label certain neighborhoods as being being worth less and when less valuable based on the racial demographic makeup of those places. And so that's definitely very high impact in places that have very high populations of especially Black people and other minorities. And it's still something that continues into the current day. And that's what structural refers to, where it's built into the system. And we can still see the legacies of that today. Hopefully that makes sense. And so with that, let's jump into the workshop. I did want to show you guys the visualization that we'll be able to create by the end, which is on the slide. And so we'll learn about how to manipulate the data and choose things to make, to be able to see by time and across the boroughs, the number of evictions. So I'll be handing it off to back to Zoe for this next part. Thank you, Pranathi. Today, we're going to be using a coding platform called Google Colab. This is actually a really useful tool. It's Google Docs, but for Python. It also works with a few other programming languages, but it's really handy because it allows you to basically share code with someone without having to interface with GitHub. Google Colab, this Jupyter Notebook style Python platform works through Google Drive. So once folks have had a chance to open up the Colab, I will walk us through how to make a copy so that you can edit your own document directly throughout the course of the workshop. Once everyone has this open, we're going to click in the upper left-hand corner. You can go to File and just any other sort of Google Doc you can save a copy in your drive. So I'll do that as well. And that'll open in a new tab. And now you can rename this whatever you want. So maybe I'll call this a working version of this template. And now that you have this new document, you can work directly in this during the course of the workshop. Let me do one thing really quickly, which I forgot to do earlier. I'm going to stop sharing my screen really quickly. We also have another version of this notebook that is acts as a key. So if you ever get behind, I'm going to share this with y'all so that we can all stay on the same page because I know it's a fairly large group. Okay. So now that we all have our notebooks available in front of us, a thank you to Pranathi. We're going to keep all of the things that she said about keeping context in mind and thinking about how we interpret data and how data visualizations interpret our understanding of relationships between different parameters and how that can be used as both an exploratory tool and an argumentative tool. So today, we're going to go over some of the basics of Python. We're going to talk about some basics of Pandas and Altair, which are these two libraries that we're using to support our data analysis and our data visualization. And then once we work with that a little bit with a simple example, we're going to move on and use a public data set from New York City Open Data. We're using a data set on eviction to create some basic data visualizations in Altair. And then we're going to build on these basic tools to create more complex data visualizations using the same data set and start thinking about how we might create even more complex data sets. Some of the resources that we're using and that you can reference at the end of this workshop, or if you're looking back on it, are Altair documentation. It's pretty thorough, so it's, that's a really good resource. If you're new to programming, the web is, for most programming languages, full of pretty good documentation. We're also going to be using, of course, NYC Open Data, and then the link to the specific data set that we'll be using is here, but we'll return to that in a bit. So first things first, we'll start by getting warmed up with Python. Before we dive into Altair and Panda, let's just go over some basics of Python. One of the most important things to know about Python is that it's an object-oriented programming language. Very basically, this means that we can describe different objects as having associated method methods and characteristics. And then these methods and characteristics are bundled into classes. So for example, this is just a broad example. If we defined a class called car, cars might have a make and a model, maybe a color, mileage, and then maybe we have some methods associated with cars. So maybe we say, okay, I have this car and I can refuel its tank. I can repaint the body. I can take it to the shop. And then a yellow cab might be one instance of a car. That's a type of data. A car is a type, and then we have this one particular instance. In general, the most basic types 
of data that we're going to be working with, especially for today. In Python are strings, integers, floats, and lists. So let's get started by just exploring some strings. I'll also make a comment here that in Python, in general, it's really good practice to make sure that your code has comments so that you can understand what you're doing. It helps you keep track of your thought process. And also so a reader who's looking over your code, let's say tomorrow, can also know what you're doing. So we can leave a comment by putting a pound sign and then writing whatever your comment is. A lot of people will put a pound sign and then a space and then write their comment, but that's not necessary. Anything that follows the pound sign will be considered a comment. So there's an example of that here. And you'll see that in this template, I've left a lot of comments to help structure the code, but those are just to serve as a guide. So on your own document, you can follow along with whatever I'm typing and I'll pause along the way to give you time to type. So first, let's just define a string. A string is a word or a phrase, and we denote a string by putting it in quotes, either double quotes or single quotes. So here we've defined two strings, either with double quotes or single quotes. And we can also assign a variable name to our string. So we could say our first string. And we assign a variable by writing the variable name and then a, an equal sign and then whatever data we want to store in that variable. So in this case, we want to store a string and we'll just store this as a string. The next thing we want to do is print our string. So we can just try that here. We can either print it directly by writing our string into the argument of this print function. In Python, you'll have function, which are specific words that you'll use. And then the argument of the function will go within parentheses here. So for print, we can have print. We can either print a variable or it can print the string directly. So we could also print our first. And if we do that here and we press the little run button, oops. Oh, we see that we actually have an error. And I think that's because I've made a typo in my variable. Maybe this is a good lesson on interpreting errors. A lot of Python coding environments and Jupyter Notebooks is pretty good about that. Google Colabs is also pretty good about this. If you have an error in your code, they'll try as best as they can to point out to you where it came from. It's not always clear. You might have to do some debugging. That's part of the process. But here we can see that they've pointed out that my error was in line 14, which is this line and, or rather it's this line, and it doesn't recognize our variable our first string. And that's because a few moments ago I had out first string, but now it's our first string. So we can keep running that. Great. So we see that we've printed our string twice. And as we expected, our first string and this is a string both print the same way. Yes, this is the fun of live coding. We can also work with other types of data. We said A, we can assign a different variable name. We can say, this is a different string. That's another example of a string. We can also have another variable that's an integer. An integer is a number that doesn't have a decimal point, more or less. That's a work, pretty good working definition. So five or six or 19. In Python, we can call a number that has a decimal point. We call that float. So you could say this variable C, which is a float, is 4.6 or it could be 4.0, it could be 4.99 up to you we can run that and uh, oh just a quick comment if you haven't used google collab before or jupyter notebooks which is a similar structure you can run an individual cell by pressing the run button here or at least on a mac pressing shift enter so that'll run it so now that we've looked at strings and integers and floats it's important to think about why do we even have these classes in the first place so Python functions sometimes only take a certain type of data. However, sometimes Python functions can take a variety of different data types. And in that case, Python will try to make its best guess about what you mean and what you want to be done with that data. So we'll work with a quick example using the plus operation. But here, the plus operation will mean different things depending on the type of data that we're working with. So for example, let's just start by trying to add two integers. This is not a trick question. It'll be pretty simple and it should work as expected. So we can define two integers, A and B, and you might notice that I'm recycling A and B from above. These are different values than they were in our previous example, but since I am assigning a new value to them, the old value will just be wiped out. So this is the new value of A and B. So we can print A plus B here. The answer is 11. 
that's as we expect. A and B are both integers, so we expect that 5 plus 6 would be 11. We can do a similar thing here. We can say, we actually, we want to add a float to an integer. So maybe A is 5.6 and B is, B can just be 1. So now what happens if we say A plus B, print A plus B, we'll get 6.6. .6. So even though we've added a float to something that's an integer and doesn't have a decimal value, Python knows to interpret this integer as 1.0. And so Python knows how to add those two things. Now let's try adding some strings. So we can have a string A called this that is equivalent to this is A and B will be space string. And then we print A plus B. We'll see that we get a concatenated string, which includes, combines both the, this is A and a string. And so all together, this is a string. And You'll notice that in this case, because we're not working with numerical data, which adding is commutative, if we reverse the order of B plus A within this print statement, the order of these two strings will flip. So that no longer really makes a lot of sense. So we'll switch it back to A plus B so that it looks nice. Now let's try working with different data types. So we tried adding a float to an integer and that worked out pretty well because they're both numerical. But as we saw with our example with strings, Python interprets that operation very differently with strings than it does with numerical data. So what happens if we try to combine numerical data and a string? So let's say B is six and we want to print A plus B. You see here we've gotten an error again because it's saying that we can't concatenate a string to an integer. And so this is why it's important to think about what sorts of data types we're working with, because sometimes certain functions won't play nice with if you're combining different data types or if you're using a specific data type, but Python expects that if you're using that function, actually you should be using it, referencing a different data type. So as we've seen, it might be a good idea to check what data type do you have. So we can do something, print the type of a func of a variable or an object. So we could say, what's the type of uh, this object called string. And if we print it out, it'll give us the class string. str is short for string. We could also do the same thing with an integer and we'll get int, which is short for integer. We could get a little more fancy and say, what's the type of five divided by two? And that's a float because five divided by two is 2.5. And so this can be a really handy tool, especially for debugging. If you're not sure actually what exactly does Python think you're working with, that can be useful. So we've explored working with sort of individual objects, floats, integers, strings, but we can actually store these all together. In Python, we can store data in a number of ways. Today, we're going to be working briefly with dictionaries, which basically store data in key value pairs. And you don't need to understand them exactly. It's okay if this part doesn't quite click. Understanding or at least being familiar with dictionaries can be useful because dictionaries form the basis of some other data formats. JSON, which is what we'll use later, and JSON is frequently used for larger data sets. So let's just practice writing a little dictionary. Let's say we want to make a dictionary and dictionaries have key and value pairs. So you could have something that is apple and color. The color is green because I have green apples. We can print this dictionary just to see what it looks like. It's not going to look much different than what we have on screen. And you'll see we have fruit, apple, color, green. Now we can create a slightly larger dictionary. So maybe we'll just call that a larger dictionary. Okay. You can name it whatever you want. And we can get a little more fancy. And instead of having an individual value following our label fruit, we can actually have a list of values. So maybe we have multiple fruits. We have an apple and we have an orange. Maybe we have a lemon. Then we can describe the colors of these fruits. So we could say the color of the apple is green. That's we Granny Smith apples. The color of the orange, that's orange, it's a little boring. And the color of the lemon is going to be yellow. Maybe we also have, we're doing Granny Smith apples. Maybe the type of orange is Kara Kara. And I'm writing off screen. Oops. Kara Kara. And maybe we have a Meyer lemon. So now when we print a larger dictionary, 
It'll look roughly the same as what we have, but you can see that we've organized these values into categories. And the reason I bring this up is that when we're working with large data sets, oftentimes these large data sets will be organized spreadsheets. So they'll have columns and rows. And so dictionaries, which form the basis of some of the ways that we can format these larger data sets, operate in a similar way. So we see that if each of these entries is a row, we have a green Granny Smith apple, then each of these keys is a column, the name of a column. We'll return to this. It's if this isn't quite clicking right now. And in the end, at the end of the day, we're going to be using a different data format anyway. Don't stress it. But I just want to introduce this idea to you because it is something that comes up a lot in Python. Let's move over and start talking a little bit more about data visualizations with Python. So today, as I mentioned, we're going to be working with two libraries. Libraries are really handy because Python doesn't have all of the functions you might want to use, but libraries allow you to import extra functions that Python maybe in and of itself does not have. And this basically means that you don't have to write everything from scratch. So it can be really useful. It can help you get a lot more power out of the language that you're using. So when we import a library, we're going to say import the name of the library. So today we're using Altair. We're also importing Panda. Altair is our data visualization library. It's really helpful for charting things. And we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but it's pretty comprehensive. Pandas is going to be our data manipulation library. We'll also talk about that a little bit more. So you can run this cell and there you go. We've imported Altair and Pandas. And then anytime you want to use a specific function from either of these libraries, you'll write Altair dot function name, whatever else you're writing. But we might get bored of writing Altair and Pandas every time, so we can assign a nickname to each of them. So instead of saying import Altair, we'll say import Altair as Alt and import Pandas as PD. Whatever you import it as doesn't really matter. These are just nicknames. You can assign whatever nickname you want, but these are standard and fairly short. They're short and clear, and this is respect convention. So we can run this again. Great. So now we can actually use Pandas and Altair. So first, we had our little fruit dictionary, but let's make a people dictionary. So let's call this, this will just be another example dictionary. If we don't writing the whole dictionary on one line, we can just press enter after we write our curly brackets, and that gives us a little more space to write things. As I mentioned earlier, this key will be become a column. So let's say we have a column called name, and we have the name of five people. Mark, Robert, I'm going to pull, start pulling names for the crowd, and I don't know. Okay, and then we put a comma to tell Python that, okay, we're not talking about names anymore. Now we're talking about ages. So we'll make another column called age, and this will include the ages of the different people that we've just listed. So maybe Susan's 19, Mark is 27. Robert's 44, Diego's 56, I guess I'm going in ascending order, Frank is 40, and Sion 11. So now we have this new dictionary called People Dictionary. We can print it to see what it looks like. And we see that we have Susan, Mark, Robert, Diego, Frank, Siana, and these are their ages. So as I mentioned, Pandas is... A really useful a really useful library for data analysis and manipulation. They have a lot of functions that allow you to perform both simple and more complicated computations on your data. So it can be good if you're doing any sort of statistical analysis. But at the base, the foundation of pandas is something called a data frame. And so a data frame is basically how pandas organizes large data sets and it functions similarly to a spreadsheet. So it's data organized in columns and rows. And pandas is pretty handy because it can convert certain data formats directly into a data frame. So if you have a CSV file, an Excel file, Pandas knows how to handle those and just convert it into a data frame. So that can be handy if you're looking for, if you're working with large data sets or public data. And it can also convert things like dictionaries, for example, into a Pandas data frame. So let's practice converting our dictionary into a data frame. So I'm going to make a data frame called people underscore df is short for data frame. We're going to call pandas by writing pd dot data frame and we'll make data frame out of our dictionary if I can spell it correctly. Now let's see what happens when we print. 
people underscore df. So let's print our data frame just to find out. And as you see, compared to the dictionary that we had above, which was just formatted basically a string, pandas has gone ahead and organized this as a little table. We can do another thing to this table when we're printing it called dot head or to, to this data frame. So dot head shows you by default the first five rows of the data frame. You can see that actually Google Colab is telling me this information right now. So if we run print again, it'll print the first five rows. You can also specify in the argument, maybe we only want to see the first two rows because we just care about making sure that all the data is in the right format. Maybe you don't know what name means. So you want to know if it's full name or first name. This is a quick and easy way to just check. Okay, yeah, I thought that's what was going on. So that looks great. Thank you, Pandas, for organizing our dictionary. Now we can play around a little bit with our new data set, with our data frame using Pandas. So let's say that all of these people that we've entered into this dictionary, they're actually a family. So we want to give them a new column called full name. And the new column, full name, will be the old column name plus a string. So plus some last name, Johnson. Now what happens, now what happens when we print our new data frame or a new column? So now we, as you can see, we have this new column called full name that takes the name column and appends the word or the string space Johnson to the original name column, to the values in the name column. So Pandas can be really helpful in this way if you're wanting to manipulate individual columns. If you have to do data cleaning, you might be able to do that column by column, depending on the data that you're working with and how clean your data set is. But this is a basic introduction to what that might look. The Pandas documentation is pretty extensive, so if you're interested in that, I would recommend that you check it out. On your own, if everyone can do this for maybe a minute, try adding another column. You can make it whatever you want. I recommended that you add a column that assigns a favorite animal or favorite pet to each person. Maybe they're intra-family rivalries between whose pet is the best. But just try that and see how that works out. I'll give everyone a minute or two. So I'll tell you what I would do. I'll have people DM making a new column called pets. And maybe this is just at, at. I'm a cat person, so I'm going to make everyone's favorite pet. Again. Maybe someone has a fish. Maybe someone has a rabbit. I think we have six people. Oh no, maybe we only have five people. Let's see. We have six. Okay, and now we can print. Yep. And as you can see, we have this new column called pets. Susan and Mark, both their cats. Robert and Diego are dog people. Siana has a rabbit and Frank has a fish. We have a question about why okay. the table starts with zero instead of... Oh, yes. That's a great question, actually. Thank you for bringing that up. So in Python, and this is pretty common, I think, across other coding languages. In Python, everything is indexed starting with zero. So your first row or your first item in a list, those will be called the zeroth item or the zeroth row. And so if you ever have to use any functions that require you to index, that's something you do want to keep in mind. And you will get the hang of as you make your way through. But yes, thank you for bringing that up. That is a sort of important point. I don't think we're going to be working with indexes directly in this workshop, but if you ever go on with Python or with pandas, it, it will come up. You can, if you're working with pandas, they'll allow you to specify, okay, I just want to look at the first row or the first column, in which case you'd have to use a zero. All right, let's move on and just start talking a little bit about plotting. So as I mentioned, we're going to be using Altair, but I do want to point out that we actually can plot using pandas. So in order to do this, uh, we can say whatever our data frame is called, dot plot, and then dot bar if we want a bar chart, and then you can specify your data. So I'll just show this really quickly. We're not going to come back to it, so it's okay if you don't follow along. The first thing we're going to do is run this cell, which allows us to plot things within the notebook, so the notebook will show it. And then we're going to do people df, that's the name of our data frame, dot plot, dot bar. Let's say our x is going to be first names. I don't think we need last names. And let's see how that looks. So we got this very basic bar, bar chart that has names on the x-axis and ages on the y-axis. It's really simple. It was pretty quick, so it's not a bad idea if you just want to look at your data really fast. But the reason that we're going to use Altair instead is that its visualization package basically is pretty limited. The most comprehensive data visualization library for Python is something called matplotlib, which probably some of you have heard of, but 
Matplotlib can be really difficult to work with just because the syntax tends to be pretty finicky and you have to specify on almost every value or almost every sort of parameter. But Altair is a lot simpler. It's a lot more comprehensive. It handles all the messy stuff on the back end, which is why we call it a visualization grammar. And it's similar to ours, ggplot2, if you've used that before. So that's what we're going to stick with today. It's going to give us the nicest plots and it's going to be the best sort of introduction. Okay, before we get into plotting, making a chart using Altair, I'm just going to run through the process here. So in Altair, we are going to specify our data. The way that we'll do that is by telling Altair, we'll call alt.chart and then we'll tell Altair what data set are we pulling from? And we're going to pull from our data frame. The next thing we're going to do is tell Altair what type of plot, what type of chart do we want to make? Today we're going to make, or right now we're going to make a bar chart. And then you get to tell Altair what's the X, what's the X value, what's the Y value. So let's explore that. So let's say we want a chart. We'll say alt, right? That's how we tell Python that we're talking about Altair right now. That's the nickname we gave it. Chart. And then we'll tell them we want to use the people data frame. That's where we stored all of our dictionary data in a, pi and, uh, in a pandas data frame. We're going to make a bar chart. So we say mark underscore bar. If you wanted a line chart, you could say mark underscore line. But because we're using people's names, that won't give us the nicest plot. And we'll, we'll make a false correlation between ages and name. So we're going to stick with a bar chart for now. And in order to tell Altair what we're even putting in this bar chart, we write dot encode. In Altair, dot encode is where you're going to put most of your information. If you want to get more complicated charts, this is where most of the information about coloring and conditional formatting will go. But for now, we'll just say we want X to be name. That's the name of the column that we're trying to plot. And Y is going to be age. Actually, before we go on and do that, I'm going to intentionally leave an error. So as you can see, I've gotten a, a syntax error because Tear doesn't understand how this line is flowing into this line. Just pointing this out because it is important to leave commas to separate the arguments that you're including in encode. Okay. So if we run that, we'll see that now we have this pretty clean little plot. It has name, our pandas plot above, it has name on the x-axis, age on the y-axis. We can also name our plot. So let's say this is our age chart. Then if I run it again, it actually won't show up because we've told P Python, hey, I want you to know that I might make this chart and I'm going to call it age chart. So just remember that. But it actually doesn't know that we want it now. So if we want to show that plot, we can just write age chart and now it'll show again. Some other things we can do with, with this sort of syntax, we can actually specify colors. So we can do this one of two ways, which we'll explore right now. We'll also return to this later. You can e enter a color into the parentheses next to mark underscore bar or mark underscore line, or we can also specify a color within that dot encode. So underneath where you write your X and Y values. So let's try this again. I'm actually going to copy and paste what we have up here so that we don't have to rewrite it. Okay, so I've just copied and pasted the code that we wrote to make this initial chart. So let's try this the first way where we want to specify the color next to mark bar. Let's make this, let's make it green. Why not? And again, because I gave it a variable name, I actually have to call that variable in order for Python to know that we want to see what this looks like. So if I print that out, we get the same plot as before, but it's in green. We can do this similarly down here. We can, this time we want to make the color a function of age. So we can specify that here. And if you scroll down, you'll see that now, in fact, Altair has handled this on its own. It's figured it out. It's okay, great. You told me you want color to be related to age. So here's a plot where color is related to age. If we want to get more specific, right, Altair defaults to blue. Maybe we actually want it to be green. Then we'd have to do something a little more complicated, but still manageable. So we'd say alt.color. And now we get to actually enter a bunch of fields. We can say both the thing that we want color to be dependent on, and then we can enter this syntax, which might look a little tricky, but just try to follow along as best as you can. And we'll write scheme equals green. So what this is telling Altair to do is saying, hey, I want color and I want it to be a function of something, but I have actually a lot of instructions to tell you. So let me put it into this whole thing, which is alt.color. 
and I'll put the instructions between these parentheses. So our instructions to Altair now. Uh, uh, our instructions to Altair now are that we want color to be a function of age, which is the same as before. But actually, we also want to give it the specific color scheme, greens. That should be greens, plural. And Altair has a lot of built-in color schemes. They're well documented. So if you look them up online, you'll be able to find them that way. And so now, as you can see, we've basically created the first chart, the, the chart we had before, but this time, instead of blue scale, we have a green scale. And just one thing to note, the first time we made it right, our color was fixed. The second time, the color is dependent on this particular data. So before we start working more closely with public, public data, I just want to introduce the idea of JSON data. So JSON is just a format that data can be put into. It's really common across the web. Uh, and it's common for these larger public data sets. And it's very similar actually to a Python dictionary. So it'll have keys and values. So once again, let's just make another dictionary. Let's say we have a balloon and the color of the balloon is red and we have a dog. The color of the dog is brown. If we run that, it'll just be a dictionary. Now what we can do is convert this dictionary into a JSON file. So we'll write import JSON and then this JSON Python library we'll just call by saying JSON and it has this function dumps, which basically means that you can convert another data format to a JSON file. Now let's practice printing our new JSON. As you can see, it prints, it looks exactly the same as for example, if we had printed our dictionary, they're identical. But what if we printed the type of the JSON and the type of the dictionary? Actually, we see that whereas they're formatted exactly the same, the JSON object is actually a string and the dictionary is Python's basically interpretation of something that looks the same as that JSON string. So are there any, at this point, I guess I'll pause and take questions. We're about to move on to talking with public data. It's talking about public data and working with that more closely. If any of the dictionary stuff is unclear or if any of the sort of panda stuff is unclear that's totally okay all of this is documented pretty well as i said in both the pandas and altair documentation right now is more about getting the feel for it and it's more important that we're getting a sense of the flow and getting a sense of okay these are fields that i could change and if i had this idea if i wanted to format things differently this is the type of thing i might look up all right i'm going to hand it back over and we're going to start working with public data Hi everyone. Actually, I noticed that someone's question in the chat was, do you need to use pandas if you're using Altair? And you can think of pandas as this really, as this really broad, widespread library that has a lot of different functionalities. You can make data frames. Those are extremely powerful. They're pretty equivalent to making a table. And there's a lot of stuff that pandas can do, but it's pretty widespread. So you can Chain, you and so you can do things with data visualizations in Python in pandas as we saw, but then Altair is this library that is very specifically for making data visualizations. So you can change the subtitle font, the title font. You can change colors pretty easily, and it's all very specified. So it, it becomes it becomes pretty easy. Or you can specify a lot more things in a Altair visualization than you can with a pandas one. So hopefully that makes sense. Altair just gives you a bit more control over what you're able to see in your visualizations. And I know that there was a lot of talking and a lot of coding and going along, but I'm going to take a little break and show you the NYC Open Data website. So you, at least you can just sit and watch for a little bit instead of trying to frantically work alongside it. But if you you can see here. All I did is we linked the NYC Open Data link in the collab. So you can just click that. And I'm going to show you how to import the data in a JSON URL. But first, let's just click on that link and then go here. And so this is what, if you click on any data set inside the NYC Open Data repository, you are going to see this version of this page, but a version for each data set you choose. So here is going to be a just a quick description of your data set. And there will also be the department that has provided this data set. And that's also something that you find here. And then you see a bit more information. And then if you scroll down, you can see the number of rows and columns. And then also all of the columns in this data set. And some of these can be hard to understand just by name. So we're going to, so you can see the description and also, for example, with executed date, you can see the, both the data type of what is, of what the things in that column are made of for, and so in this case, it's floating timestamp. 
you can also have just plain text. And then the stuff that you're going to see as the column name is not exactly this nicely capitalized, really pretty title here. It's going to be which under API field name. So if you're ever getting an error that this column doesn't exist, you might want to go back to this part of your respective data set and then look into what the API field name is and then use that instead. So that's a little bit of intro into how to navigate this page. Something you can also do is if we just go to the website in general, they have a pretty good categorization for people who are new to open data and gives a bit more of a primer. And then you can browse the data catalog. I think Carrie was saying earlier about all of the different really cool data sets that exist. And so you can just take your time and explore. But to get that JSON URL we were talking about, you would need to go to API and then go to the API endpoint, which you would want to be a JSON file, and then copy that. And that URL has already been copied for us. And instead of having to copy and paste it everywhere, what we can do is we can store it as the object of data URL, as we saw earlier. So we put the name on the left of the equal sign and then the thing we're making it equal to on the right. So the next thing we need to do is use pd.readjson to create a new data frame and call it eviction underscore DF. A really big proponent of copying and pasting whenever possible to minimize the amount of errors we make. So I'm literally just going to copy and paste this part that we see right here where it tells us how exactly to use pd.readjson and then just copy and paste it. And then we can fill in what is what we want to change. So for example, we want to change df to be eviction df. So eviction df. And then we need the URL where the data is hosted. And we, if we recall, we stored that as data underscore URL. And so all we have to do is run the cell. And the reason that it says it's not defined is because I didn't ever run this cell. So let's run that and then run that again. And if we want to print the first five rows of the data of the data frame, something we can do is eviction underscore df dot head. And if you don't put anything in the parentheses, it does the first five. And you can, if you want the first one or two rows, you can just put the first number of rows and you can just put a number in the parentheses. But five is good for us. And so we see that all of those column names that we were looking at earlier are all here. And so we know that our data frame has been properly created. So the first thing, if you remember that bar chart that we were trying, that we were trying to work towards earlier, it was or that we saw earlier from the slides, something we needed to do is to create a histogram of evictions over time or the bar chart of evictions over time. This is the syntax or the way that we need to make a bar graph of this data. So we, again, just copy and paste and then put in the information we want. I'm going to say, since our table is eviction underscore df. All we have to do is then also put in the x data and the y data. So the thing that we need to put on the x axis should be the time from 2017 to 2022. So the column that corresponds to that is going to be executed date with the floating timestamp, with the floating timestamp data type. So all we have to do is turn x data into executed date. And something that we need to think about for the Y data is to think about what exactly it is we're trying to measure. So right now we have, what is it, 67,500 rows of different individual evictions that occurred and then a bunch of different information about them. And so what we want to do is take each of those, take all 67,500 of those rows and then turn them into something that is grouped by the specific date that they occurred on or the time that they occurred on. And then we'd be able to get a visualization with many of the, with over time, how many, what was a frequency at which we saw the, these evictions happen. And something that so for the Y data, what we would do, or the way that Altair uh, calculates this is with the count function. So just put the count function there and then we can run the cell. And the reason it's not printing anything is because I haven't put chart at the bottom, which can help us, which, and if you put the name of the chart, whatever is here at the bottom, then it'll print out that object. So this is interesting because it's not exactly what we're looking for. And does anyone have any ideas as to why? And some hints are all of these numbers that are at the bottom. What's happening here is that for some reason, Hair is seeing all of these different timestamp datas where it has 
the year and then the month and then the day and then the exact time frame or the minute by minute by millisecond occurrence of each of these evictions. And it's not able to turn those into a timeline. And so the reason that's happening is because Altair has interpreted our executed date as something called the nominal data. It's viewing these as just distinct separate categories. But what we want is to turn that into time. And the way you can change that is by specifying at this part at the, within your x-axis for Altair to think of the data that you're presenting to it as a specific thing, whether it's quantitative as a specific data type, whether it's quantitative, ordinal, nominal, temporal, or GeoJSON. I think I linked the Altair API to give a bit more context for that. What we want to do next is to make a bar graph of the eviction data, but we want ex executed date to be read as temporal data or a time and date value to create that timeline we were talking about. Again, a fan of the copy and paste. We're just going to copy and paste this again. I'm going to delete the chart equals here because I don't want to override the same variable. And if you just do alt chart, alt dot chart, it, it will still create a graphic. And so all we need to do is turn executed date and then put a colon and then a T, which is what this little explanation tells us. And so if we run the cell, um, we get this and it's a lot better. We can see some things and we can see a little bit of a general trend from 2017 to 2022, but we can't really see the divisions between any specific set of time. And it's also a little bit ugly. Something we want to do is arrange the data by year using pandas. And this is a little bit where that pandas versus Altair question comes in, where we can think of pandas as that data manipulation library where we can create new columns in our data frame and then use those to plot in panda uh, uh, to use those to plot in altair but altair is a lot more about taking the columns and data as it's given and then playing with it afterwards and the way that we can arrange the data by year using pandas is by creating a new column called year and then using a function called date time index. So we would do eviction underscore df and then by adding year, then it's creating a new column and then we do pd dot date time index eviction df muted date. Oh, and I need to put this in quotes because that's the name of a column. Executed date dot year. So basically what this function has done, what datetime index does is it takes the eviction DF data frame, takes the column executed date, which we saw on the on the NYC Open Data website, that that format is a timestamp. And so it extracts just the year. So if we were if we look at what we were seeing above, it just puts it just takes that 2017. And so what we can do is do that by a year. In the interest of time, I'm going to show you how to do it by month as well. And then and we'll show you how to combine year and month together. And I'll explain that a little bit later. So I'm going to copy and paste it below and switch it to month. So that will extract that month value, which as we saw is this zero one. And so let's run the cell. And next we can create a chart of evictions versus years using year as a temporal value so again let's we're all about the copy paste let's do that here and then instead of executed date colon t we'll do year colon t so let's run the cell again and something that's funky about this is that there seems to be a lot of these spaces between the lines and there's also only one per year and maybe we want something that has a bit more information between each year and the reason this is happening is because when you don't specify a, a year, a day, a month, and a specific time frame, Altair will just assume all of those are zero. So this plot is seeing this as January 1st, 2017, zero midnight. And then this one's 2018, 2019, and 2020. So it's just a bit unintuitive. And so in this case, we might actually want to create a chart of evictions versus years where a year is a nominal variable. And so... As always, just copy, paste. And then if you see here, it's creating a little nominal bar chart. And there's an explanation of that over here. And as we can see, this one's a little bit prettier, just to keep that in mind. But something that can be really helpful is if we plot by both year and month. And so 
we've given you a part here that that you can just run in the cell to see to create a sequence of years and months. So 2017, January, 2017, March. And then pandas will be able to or Altair will be able to run that into a sequence and see it as a timeline and then go across that way. If we want to see what this line does, we can just print the head, print the head of the data frame. So we do fiction for df dot. I think that should work. Yes. And so it has. And so since we added all of these columns at the end, we can see year, month, and then year slash month. And as I was saying, it gives us the year and then the March, so 2018, June, 2020, January. And so now we can create a plot using our new column. And let's go back to the code we had previously that was here and just copy and paste again and instead of year colon t we can do year underscore month because that was the name of the column we made that has created this sequence and so let's run the cell oh she's not showing up as long as it works for everyone else because i know what that data i know what that visualization looks like. we'll just save it as plot one in general for what i want you guys to do i want you to save your chart as plot one which can be helpful. And so I'm going to try and make a line chart instead and see what happens when we add it to our first plot. If you guys make a line plot and save it as plot two, you should see that year month that there's a line chart and then there's also and it's superimposed over the bar chart. Something that's important to think about is how in that space, there's going to be a space where we aren't able to see a bunch of data. We can actually see it in this graph, but there's this large space. And does anyone know what the event that happened that made it so that there's no data here was? And it was since it was during the pandemic. Why is there zero on the count of eviction? Yes, exactly. So Laura's correct. It is the eviction moratorium. And that's why it's really important when you're looking at your data to be able to kind of see what exactly is happening historically and socially so you're able to know that it's not that the data was just missing or it's not that all of a sudden there was a sudden decrease in evictions but that there was a literal stopping on it i think i'm just going to keep on making the visualizations with executed date t instead of the year month even though year month looks prettier just so that we can at least objectively see what's happening so let me plot one executed date Okay, it's not ideal. And if you guys stick with doing year month and add the plots together, plot one plus plot two, what you should see is that there's, it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of agreement between the line plot and the bar plot pretty far in until we hit the eviction moratorium. And then at that point, it makes it seem there's a sudden decrease, but it's pretty gradual. And so it makes it seem across time in the bar chart that there is that there is suddenly just a steady decline in the number of cases when in fact there was just no data. And I think we mentioned that in this interpretation warning, but I think since it's a bit hard to see on my computer, but does everyone understand the idea that in this case, a line plot was not the best choice because it made it seem there was this steady decrease in the number of evictions? And that's something that can misrepresent our data. We are attempting to troubleshoot by using Google Chrome, which is where Google Drive is, what Google Drive is native to. It's just like a Safari thing. So we didn't know this before, but Google Colab prefers Google Chrome because Google made it, likes everything to be under its own umbrella. So here we go. Just to recap, this is what the plot will look like. And for some of you, I guess this is what it did look like, which is great. As you can see, there's a gap in the data there where during the time over which the evic eviction moratorium was in place and Pranathi is generating the plots, the so, combined plot. Yes. And as we can see with the green versus the blue, if the bar chart shows that it's zero, no data, but then the line plot doesn't and it makes it seem there was just a steady decrease and then a continuation. And something that's why it's pretty important to just look at our data and figure out which visualization is making the most sense with it and which is representing the data most truthfully. And the reason this is happening is just because the way a line plot works is that Altair will plot the individual data points it's getting and then literally just draw a line connecting them. And so it's not anything is particularly going wrong. It's just that's how line plots work. 
And so now hopefully that makes sense to people and is also the right visualization to take so that people can actually see what I was talking about. And next I'm going to hand it over to Shui Ching, who is going to talk about adding that burrows component back into the back into all of this. Okay, for this section of the workshop, we're going to look at how we can specifically select a subset of the entire data set that we're working with. So for example, in the evictions data set, we might want to specifically just look at evictions data in very specific boroughs, knowing that we have a column, a column called boroughs. We can also maybe want to investigate the eviction data just for a specific type of property. So if you notice in the evictions data set, there is also a column on the residential property type. It could be a residential, the property type. So it could be residential or commercial. And sometimes filtering data in a data frame is really helpful, especially when you have to work with much larger data frames that are much, much bigger than even just evictions data. And you just want to use a subset of the data to work with. So how do we filter data in Altair? So what you can do is to use the transform filter method that selects a subset of data based on a condition. The argument to transform filters stip stipulates the conditions with which we are restricting our data. Specifically, we'll be using the field equal predicate, which evaluates whether a field, for example, the borrow column would be the field in this case, evaluates is equal to a particular value. So if we're specifically looking at eviction data in Manhattan only, the field predicate would be borrow and it would be, and the condition would be equal to Manhattan. It would be much more simpler if we can help, if we walk through the examples that we have prepared for you. So this, in the cell, we're doing a bar plot of evictions in Manhattan using Altair to select data for this bar. We'll be calling our, our eventual bar plot Manhattan evictions. And at the beginning, we're just doing everything that we've done before when Parnathy introduced the idea of creating charts under Altair. So alt.chart using, and then the first argument would be the data frame that you're working with. And then in this case, we just wanted to be a little bit more fancy, added a title as part of the configuration of the chart. We're going to call it evictions in Manhattan using Altair. This is going to help with the chart being more informative in terms of the data that it's showing. And you do, you're going to call mark bar to specify the type of plot that you want to use. We use just red arbitrarily just to denote that this is for Manhattan. Sometimes color, as you will see later, the color coding would be very helpful when we eventually want to, for example, overlay data, different groups of data onto each other. And the, and the encoding is very similar from what we've seen earlier as well. The X axes would be year, month, temporal data, and the Y axes would be count. What is different, however, is the second part of the code. So this is where on top of the chart that you just created for all of the evictions data, you would filter the chart using tr transform filter and using the field equal predicate setting the first argument field equal to borrow, which is the column that you want to be specifically looking at in order to filter your data. And the condition would be equals to Manhattan. Just for more information, there are different forms of conditions in which you can stipulate in Python. So for example, instead of wanting data to be equals to something, you could also stipulate perhaps a range such as above, above a certain number or above and equal to. All of those documentations and varieties can be found in the link on data transformation in, in, the section, in this text section above. So I'm going to switch to the empty notebook. Right. So as you can see, we have the bar plot for evictions in Manhattan using Altair display. Just for your information, we wanted to also bring up the point that you can perfectly well use pandas to also filter the data frame first and then use Altair to plot the filtered data frame. I, I emphasized this earlier when we were doing the bar plot using Altair. What you're doing is first plotting the entire evictions data frame and then using Altair to filter. But if we were to use pandas to filter our data frame first before plotting, it would look something that we're just going to call this the filtered Man Manhattan data frame. Manhattan data frame, walls eviction data frame and to filter 
you you would use a syntax syntax that looks that. I'm going to clarify what they are after I am done typing it. Eviction data frame, and then you specify it for a, it's very different though for a pan. It's yeah for panda. Yeah, so broom. So this is the column that we we're referring to, and you're going to set this to equals to Manhattan. And make sure your Manhattan is capitalized as it is in the original data frame, the API syntax. And this would be the filtered pandas. This would be the filtered data frame using pandas. And what you'll do later is just a plot the data frame using Altair. So you can call it Panda, Panda Manhattan Evictions, for example, something informative and just different from earlier. Panda Eviction Manhattan. So we do alt.pert as usual. Okay, you know what? I'm going to do what Pronathy does. I'm going to need to copy paste. And here, if I were to just copy paste using what we used earlier, I don't have to use transform filter at all. So the only thing that would be different is that we're using a different data frame. Here we have our filter data frame line. Mm -hmm. So it would look something like that. And if you were to run it, oh, I need to just eviction is not defined. Did I spell eviction wrongly? Oh no. I know. So when you Zoe went through this earlier. But when you want to specify a column, you do square brackets after the data frame. As you can see, the eventual bar plot that we have is exactly the same from what we had earlier if we ran. There's no contrast because the earlier one we didn't run, but I should have typed it. There are just two different ways to work with data. You might want to filter it before plotting or you can do it after. So for practice. You can try and see if you can make bar plots of evictions by year for each of the other boroughs separately using the following colors for the boroughs. Blue for Brooklyn, orange for Queens, gray for Bronx, and Stat green for Staten Island. And for this, you can use either of the methods that we showed above, but just for consistency, maybe we should just all work with Altair. So the first method, an example of you can how you can do it really fast this to just copy paste what property does and then rename all the things that needs to be changed and Brooklyn in code. So now you have a bar plot of evictions in Brooklyn using Altair. If you were to do for, um, a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. So someone's asking if we want to set a max for the count of records just for a comparison, does Altair allow us to plot that? A max plot. So I'm trying to think if it would make sense to plot a max. You definitely can. So I, I guess for bar plot, you technically wouldn't have to because each would only have one, one value, but you definitely can. So I guess it would just show, you could just filter for the max amount in, you can filter for all the bar. So you filter the borrows column. And then you have all the evictions count. So you count the number of rows where you only have evictions data in a certain borough. And that's the number of evictions that took place in that borough. And then actually, I'm not really sure what max counting records per year. So you can do that for each of the year. I think it would, it would just be really complex. Plus, it wouldn't make sense to just compare maximum because you essentially would only have five values, if that makes sense. Unless you want to reiterate that for each year. We also have, so there's a few folks who are struggling around the coding areas that you copy pasted. If you can just go back and that really quick, or not even really quickly, but just go over what you did when you're copy pasting the code. Yeah, definitely. I can do that for Queens as well. So we're, everything that we're doing for the other boroughs are this are, are essentially the same, except for the fact that it's for another borough. So all the coding and the syntax remains the same. So what we first do, did in the Manhattan evictions bar plot is to name our eventual bar plot. In this case, we're going to rename what was previously Manhattan evictions to Queens, because now we are looking at the eviction data set for Queens. And we are doing the same thing that we did even with Pronathy, creating a chart with Altair, we're calling alt.chart. And the first argument that you need is the data set that you're working, data frame that you're working with. So in this case, it's eviction data frame. This remains the same. The title, however, will be different because now we're doing evictions in Queens using Altair. And Mark Bar is the same 
is the same thing where you just specify the type of chart that you want. In this case, it would be a bar plot. If you want a line, it would just be a line. In this case, we want a we want a bar specifically. And the color, as we said, would be different since we want to use the color code orange for the plane. The encoding would be the same because the X and Y axes are still the same, but what, and the transform filter function would still be, be the same function that we need to use for all the other boroughs. You're using the same field equal to predicate because we're setting a borough equal to a specific value. In this case, it would be a specific string corresponding to the name of each borough in New York City. The field as the first argument borough would be the same because we're only filtering the data according to the borough's column. And what would be different is just the condition. So in this case, it would be queen. Maybe I'll just walk through everyone. What would, yeah, I'll just use an instructor's key to walk through with everyone what everything would look eventually. So we will have coded evictions in Manhattan using Altair. We showed it using how you can filter data using pandas. And this is the practice section where we had evictions in Brooklyn. We also did evictions in Queens. What we did not do was evictions in the Bronx. But it will be the same thing, except you're just going to change the names again. You're going to change the title to Bronx. You're going to change the color code. And you're just going to change the condition for the field predicate and call it Bronx. Same thing for Staten Island. But what we wanted to mention was that since all the earlier graphs use essentially the same axes, that is to say the year, month, temporal x axis and y equals to count, it would be easier to make evictions comparisons across boroughs by overlaying all the line plots into essentially uh, all the bar plots excuse me there's an error in this instructor key but it's just it's a bar plot to overlay all the bar plots into one single graph instead of have if you wanted to compare staten island with evictions in the bronx it's like hard to continuously switch between these two graphs you might as well have them all in one so what would that look like you can combine all borough plots by simply adding each individual borough plot to each other to make a combined plot. So we did that here. So we added if Manhattan evictions plus Brooklyn evictions plus Queens evictions plus Bronx evictions plus Staten Island evictions and stored it under a new combined plot name. And what we did here in the second line is to rename the combined plot because that, as you can see, there are a few problems with just having combined plot as it is now. The first problem is that the title of this, this combined plot is misleading. It retains the title of the first, in a way, subplot that you added. So it's called evictions in Manhattan using Altair, even though it clearly isn't. It shows all of the eviction data in, in all the boroughs. So what I did in that second line that I deleted for visualization purposes, in this second line, you can change the title of a Altair chart by doing dot properties and then stipulate title equals to, in this case, evictions across boroughs, which would give you a plot that looks at yeah, with the title changed. But there is also still something pretty misleading and wrong about these, this overlay chart. Does anyone have any ideas? What, is, what would be a difficulty in terms of reading this bar plot as it is? Maybe a hint would be that we know that there are five different colors that we should expect to see in a eviction data set insofar as there are five boroughs in New York City. Yeah, a legend is needed, but also we're not seeing five colors in most of the years that were that are being displayed. Most of the time it's just entirely gray with a little bit of green or a little bit of orange. And that doesn't make sense. It's not because Manhattan is red. It's not really for Manhattan to completely have no evictions whatsoever from 2017 to 2021. So the problem here is that because the plots are being overlaid and the Altair is not showing you the individual breakdown of each like boroughs because it's just showing you the total and whichever as long as the total is reached, the composition doesn't matter if it's being repeated. Like Manhattan, if Manhattan and, for example, Brooklyn have very, the Bronx have very sim similar levels of eviction, the Bronx or Manhattan color would be sufficient, one of, one, one of which would be sufficient instead of two. And there is no way for the color to... Yeah, what you can do as an alternative to show all the boroughs is to create a layered bar chart that would look something like that. So you're doing everything the same. 
So you, I'm just going to walk through this code with everyone. So you're creating a new chart called layer evictions and you do, you call, you, you're doing everything the same. Alt dot chart using evictions data frame, title evictions across borrows dot mark bar dot encode. Everything here is the same. What would be different is the encoding. So the X and Y axes are the same, but you are adding another line of encoding where you specify color equals to borrow. So in a way, you're not exactly grouping the data set, but you're telling Altair to color code the eventual plot that you'll see according to the borrows that they correspond to. And this is the eventual layered bar chart that you get, which is much more informative than what was previously just this. And just for completeness sake, you notice that the X and Y axes are actually not labeled to the most or not the most ideal labels for someone who wasn't with us throughout the whole entire coding process. Year underscore month wouldn't make too much sense to people or count of records is not very specific to evictions. So what you can do is rename and rename the axis titles. So in this cell, I'm just going to run it in the X axis. Everything's the same, but the encoding for the X and Y axes are different. So you're calling Altair.x and then you're just trying to reconfigure the X axis. Um, even though this is the way they do it, we're just telling her that we want the title for the X, the header for the X axis to be date executed by month and for the Y axis to be named um, number of evictions. And if you run that, you can see that the X and Y axes are changed. Yeah, and that's essentially all you need to know for this workshop. We had a few other parts below, but I'm not sure if we have the time to run through it. But I just wanted to say thank you again to Zoe, Shaisui, and Pranati, who did an amazing job putting all of this together and troubleshooting and answer questions in real time. And we all know how hard it is to code in real time. So I really appreciate it. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us.